Gracious Father, we are eternally in debt for your grace to us. Lord, forgive us of our lust of the eyes, our lust of the flesh, and Lord, and our pride of life. Lord, we are nothing without you, and in you we are everything. We just ask that you would help us to love as you love, as we consider today your great sacrifice for us. And Lord, we'll praise you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, the story and the characters of chapter 12 in Acts read more like a Hollywood script with the hero versus the villain and suspense and even comedy at every turn. But this story is true. It's a true story. Two opposing parties, good and evil. But there's a director behind the scenes and his name is God. God's hand and his providence overrules all. On one side, there is the apostles in the church of Jerusalem. They have gone nearly a decade with little or no opposition from without. Much, if not all, the persecution was directed at the Greek Christians, not these Hebrew Christian, uh, Jewish Christians. And that was directed by Paul and other parties. But with the ascent of Agrippa to governorship over the precincts of Jerusalem, things began to change. The villain of our story is Herod. Herod Agrippa I. Agrippa was the grandson of Herod the Great. He was the father of one Aristopolis who had been executed in 7 BC by his grandfather for fear that he might usurp his throne. After his father's death, while still a child, Agrippa was sent to Rome with his mother, where he was reared and educated along with other Roman aristocracy. These childhood friendships eventually led to his ruling over the Jewish kingdom nearly the extent of that of his grandfather. In 37 AD, the emperor Caligula gave him the title of king and made him ruler of the former territories of his uncle Philip. The lands in the Transjordan and that of the Decapolis, Decapolis, north of Galilee. In 39 AD, Caligula extended his rule by giving him Galilee in Perea, which was Herod the fox territory. Because Antipas, Herod the fox, Antipas, he was sent into exile. He was not such a good guy, <laughs> as we know. He's the one that beheaded John the Baptist. Finally, when his former schoolmate Claudius became emperor in 41 AD, he was given rule of Judea and Samaria, which had been under Roman pure curators for 35 years. And now there is a king. He was truly now the king of the Jews, ruling over Judea, Samaria, Galilee, Transjordan, and the Occupants. His reign as king of the Jews was from AD 37 to 44. As he rises to power, ooh, that's too loud. As he, catch that, as he rises to power. Perfect. Are we, are we good back there, buddy? Oh, yeah. All right. As he ruled, rises to power over Judea, he is pressured by the Pharisees and the other religious leaders. Here they come again the religious right, to do away with these Christians. 
On the surface, Agrippa, wanting to be on their good side, uh, on, oh, sorry, on, on the surface, he's a zealous practitioner of the Zew Jewish faith. Okay? And a patriot. But inwardly, he's all about himself. Agrippa wanted to be on their good side, on the religious right side. He wanted to do them a favor. So as he rises to power, he does them a, fi a favor by persecuting the church to get on their good side. He puts James, the eldest son of Zebedee, who is likely the head of the church, to death by beheading him. And then he proceeds to go after the mouthpiece, Peter. So he goes for the head and the mouth of the church. God's hand is behind the scene. He's orchestrating all things in their lives, and he's orchestrating everything in your life, both good and bad. There is nothing out of his control. Every breath you take is within the providence of the Almighty. And Acts 12 demonstrates these truths that, as we see, that God's hand is at work in his people's lives. At least three ways are observable from this chapter. Number one, God's hand is at work even in the death of his saints. Well, that sounds morbid, Pastor. Thanks for coming back from... Thank you, by the way, for all your prayers and the 25th anniversary. My wife and I appreciate it all. Thank you for coming back and telling us about God gives us our hand in death. That's really morbid. That's a hand I don't want. You make it sound as if God caused James' death. No. Herod Agrippa and the religious leaders were the ones that caused his death. God just permitted it. And he permitted it for his glory. In those two little verses, you don't see that. But as the chapter unfolds, and as the church unfolds, God permitted it for his glory. You know, we have plans for our lives. We all do. We often dream about them. We often work towards them. But I ask you today, does your plan match God's plan? Does your plan match his plans? Are you willing to allow God to determine the course of your life? It is his, you know. Last time I checked, you have been bought with a price, and you are not your own. The text doesn't say that um, anywhere. I mean, let, you can look at those two verses. You can read them all at once. But do you see anywhere where James is out of the will of God? Nothing in the text, nothing in the rest of Scripture ever alludes to the fact that James is sinning and, you know, like the priest of Eli or whatever, and he, you know, he, this came upon himself because of his sin. No, it doesn't say that. He's completely in the will of God. And he's put to death. The assumption is, and it should be that he was in the will of God and that he died actively serving Jesus Christ. Whether short or long, the quantity of time of our life is not what is important. It is the quality and the consistency of a walk and of a life committed to the master. We don't know how old James was when he died. I believe this is approximately 43 A.D. I would hazard to guess he's maybe in his 40s or 50s.
as I said earlier, James was likely the head of the church. He was likely the pastor of the church. And that is why Agrippa targeted him. Cut off the head and the body will die. No. Contrary to that, when you cut off the head of God's people, guess what? It flourishes and it grows. But some will say, why would God allow him this advantage? And it seems so cruel to James, his servant, whom he loved and he served. It seems so cruel that he would be beheaded. To these two comments, I rebut two truths. Our ways and our thoughts are not his ways and his thoughts. Isaiah 55, 8, 9 reminds us, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways, nor are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. We often think really small <laughs> and very narrow. God's, God's glory is big. His plans are big and his ways are beyond our ways. His words and his witnesses never die in vain. There is always a purpose, a fulfilling of his plans and his purposes in the life of his servants and those they impacted in ministry. The witness of James led on. Not, in, not just in the people of the church, okay, which grew stronger, but also those that he had impacted and shared the gospel with. Some of them may have been the hands behind Herod ordering this persecution. Secondly, the Christian life of dedication and service is not a walk in the park, but is often lined with thorns. It didn't take me long in my Christian walk to realize that it was great. <laughs> this is great. Coming to Christ is great. But you know what? It's not easy. I will not escape sickness. I will not escape death. I will not escape persecution. In fact, as a Christian walking in the will of God, I may experience it worse than anyone else. But that's not what he promised me, right? He did promise that he would be with me all the way, right? Even unto the end of the age. He promised his disciples that they would be persecuted. He promised you and I that we would be persecuted for the name of Christ. And he promised them that they would be treated as he was treated. And he also predicted James would indeed be persecuted by death. Turn to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. on the way up to Jerusalem mother mom comes okay <laughs> and here it is then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons okay she brings the two boys okay worshiping him falls at his feet desiring a certain thing of him and he said unto her what wilt thou she saith unto him grant that these my two sons may sit the one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand in the kingdom. Big plans, right? But Jesus answered and said, We know not, you, sorry, you know not what you ask. And are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? 
they said unto him, We are able. And he saith unto them, You shall drink indeed of my cup, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given of them for whom it is prepared of my father. James drank the cup of death. I am always reminded that God is good. We don't always see that. If, we, if the story ended at verse 2, would we be saying God is good? And God is always working in our lives. And he's working out the good in our lives. We just have to make sure the good is his good <laughs> and not our version of good. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good that them, to them that love God and to them who are called according to his purposes. You preach the gospel, you better be prepared to die for it. Secondly, God's hand is working delivering his people from peril. From verse 3 down to 19a, we see uh, the story of Peter. James is put to death, Peter is delivered. Peter has a predicament. Agrippa, seeing the, seeing the first murder, was well received. He sees that it's well received uh, by the Jews, proceeds to take Peter. And since it is the Passover feast, okay, Easter equals Passover there, and he does not want to shed innocent blood during it, isn't that? Oh, he's so righteous. <laughs> I, I don't want to kill him now during the feast. I'll wait till the feast is over. He has Peter imprisoned. And Peter is chained and guarded. This idea of, uh, of four, uh, what does it say there in your text? Four in verse four, four quaturians of soldiers, okay? The idea there is four fours of Roman soldiers. Three hours of duty, 12 hours of night shift to ensure maximum alertness. Two soldiers were chained to the prisoner at the ankles and, and at the wrists. And two were stationed at the door outside the prison. But Peter has a promise, doesn't he? Peter was sleeping. Sleeping as usual. But not just sleeping. He was sleeping like a baby. I mean, he's dead out. I mean, he's sleeping like a baby with not a care in the world, it seems. He was so sound asleep that the angel had to arouse him to get him up, to even to move. He has to whack him on the side of the shoulder. And then he had to practically drag him out of the jail. He's so dead asleep. Why the sleep on the night before his death sentence? Did you ever wonder that? How in the world could he be sleeping? Would you be sleeping on the night before your execution? Well, you can if you have a promise, right? Peter has a promise. And that is the promise that he would live to a ripe old age. Turn to John 21. John 21. We had studied this just a little while ago. John 21, 18 and 19. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me me you know he had a promise from the lord that he would be very old when he would die you know we can sleep we can all sleep soundly when we have the calm assurance 
that we are in God's hands. He will watch over and keep our lives. Psalm 31, 14 and 15 says this, But I trust in thee, O Lord. I said, Thou art my God. My times are in thine hand. Deliver me from the hand of mine enemies and from them that persecute me. Peter also had some power too, didn't he? What was his source of power? Two things. What was the source of power? The prayer of the saints and God's sending of an angel. Congregational prayer. This is the first, well, not the first one, okay? Uh, but we see an all-night prayer meeting here, specifically. Back in Acts chapter 1, we saw some lengthy prayer too. But here the congregational prayer meeting is held for poor Peter, okay? Deliverance was at the fourth watch between 3 and 6 a.m., according to verse 18. While the people of the church at Jerusalem prayed, God sent an angel to deliver Peter to answer their prayer. The iron gate was the outer gate that led into the city. You see the series of gates that he goes through, but this last gate, the outer gate of the city, is a huge iron gate. It was a formidable iron barrier, which took, according to historians, 20 men to open it daily, to open it for market every day, and 20 men to close it at night. But this angel had no problem in opening it. Note, the angel had to direct every single movement. <laughs> this is classic, isn't it? All right. Every single movement of this groggy apostle. Get up. Put on your coat. Tie your sandals. Sounds sound, sound like mom, right? Follow me. <laughs> It was quite obvious that this was, uh, it wasn't Peter's Houdini escape that got him out of prison, right? But rather God's deliverance through this angel. Peter had praise in verse 11. He comes out and it finally hits him. Us men are very slow to learn, right? And when Peter was come to himself in verse 11, he said, now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and de hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. Praise the Lord for the deliverance. He finally wakes up and realizes and acknowledges God's deliverance of his life from the hands of his foes. Peter has a problem, though, doesn't he? Here's where the comedy comes in. Peter is still not out of the woods. Because when he comes to an all-night prayer meeting, the church doesn't believe it's him. This reads like a sitcom, doesn't it? Verses 12 through 17. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, It is his angel. But Peter continued knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But he beckoned unto them with his hand to hold their peace, declaring unto them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. And he said, Go, show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. Peter, uh, um, you, this, like I said, it was a sitcom, but, you know, this is really him. And God has really answered your prayer. Their lack of faith is somewhat perplexing, isn't it? Why do you pray? If you don't expect to God to answer the prayer, why do you go through the uh, go through the motions of prayer? For time's sake, we can't get into uh, some of the digressions here about why do we need guardian angels if we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? 
And secondly, do you believe in guardian angels? We'll address those at another time. But back to the church's response, their lack of faith is perplexing, isn't it? It's seen in two ways. First, they think Rhoda, which means Rose, is crazy. Okay? The servant girls, you're crazy. And he's not outside the gate. He's still in prison. And secondly, they found it easier to believe that Peter had died and gone to heaven And now they see his angel, then that their prayers were indeed answered by God. They refused to believe that which they were praying for. Why are you and I so frequently shocked when God answers your prayers? Don't be. Don't be shocked. He delights to hear your prayers. He repeats over and over and over in Scripture that he delights to hear our prayers. And he delights to answer them. Mark eleven twenty four. Therefore I say unto you, whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Christ said, I promise you these. If you desire something, pray, and I will answer. They received what they sought, so they received what they sought, so don't be shocked in the power of God to do what is seemingly impossible. Cancer can just vanish away. The fear of cancer can turn to joy of good news that it is benign. He can change war situations into peace. Drought into abundance of water. Rebellion into reconciliation. No hope into a tree of life. God can do that. Last time I checked, he's powerful enough to do that. And you know what? Prayer is the greatest and most effective means of assistance against the powers of dark, darkness and the motions of sin in this world. It still is the power of prayer. You know, there's a fine line between death and deliverance. It is out of our control and completely in the control of the providence of the hand of God. This chapter clearly demonstrates God's providence and sovereignty in the affairs of both man who are wicked and those who are just, his children. God has a plan for all his children. It may not involve the drama that Peter goes through. But you know what? God still is the work and control of your life if you just yield it completely to him. Do you trust God with your life? Do you? Do you completely, unreservedly trust him for your life? There's one last situation here. And we'll quickly go through it. Verse 19b, let's start there. And he went down from Judea, this being Agrippa, to Caesarea, and there abode. And Herod was highly displeased with them of Tyre and Sidon. But they came with one accord to him, and having made Blastus the king's chamberlain their friend, desired peace because their country was nourished by him, by the king's country. And upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal, royal apparel, sat upon the throne and made an orientation unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God and not of a man. Oh, that so reminds me of 2008 with Mr. Obama, doesn't it? And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory. And he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghosts. Harry goes down to Caesarea. to address some issues about commerce. He uses the opportunity to give a speech. The text states that he appeared in his royal, royal, ah, royal robes. Historians state that his garments were made of silver. Can you imagine that? <laughs> That's a preacher's that dress all in white. Complete silver. And it glistened in the radiant morning sun, adding to the fuel to his ego. Instead of political success, so Herod 
had a final illness. His pride in taking of innocent blood would be repaid in full. He was miraculously smitten by the hand of God before the people who lauded him as a god. The ancient historian Josephus' account is nearly identical to that of Luke's. Josephus states that he was stricken with acute pain in his abdomen, and he died five days later. God wants you and I to, and the world to know that he will not share his glory with another. This king of the Jews is a fake. And he is an utter failure. And he immediately meets his doom. But you know what? The gospel continues on, doesn't it? Look at verses 24 through 25. But the word of God grew and multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had finished their ministry and took with them John, whose surname is Mark. The spread of the gospel is unstoppable. With the sudden removal of Agrippa, a persecution of the church ends, and once again the word of God flourishes. Kings and nations, the most ardent of religious opponents, and even the wickedness and unbelief of men cannot stop this powerful force. Nothing can stand in the way of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not even the gates of hell can prevail against it. James, the half-brother of Jesus, fills the sandals of James, the son of Zebedee, to become the leader of the church in Jerusalem. With the relief mission complete, the two great missionaries, Saul and Barnabas, return to Antioch, taking a wet-behind-the-ears companion and helper named John Mark. And we're set for the stage of the greatest work yet. Westward expansion. Global expansion to the uttermost parts of the earth of the unstoppable gospel. Good news. Great news. The greatest news that Jesus is Lord and he saves to the uttermost to them that come to him in faith. It is now either A.D. 45 or 46, some 15-plus years after the resurrection of the Lord. Jerusalem and the apostles fade into the background while Paul and the church of Antioch, by which he is sent, move noticeably into the foreground to center stage in the redemption history recorded in Acts. God's hand, though seemingly mysterious, so mysterious to us, is most assuredly true and faithful. He works out his plan, leading and directing his people who are sold out for him in sometimes inscrutable ways, yet according to the promises and will of God. Whether through death or deliverance, God's people are protected and led triumphantly, and his name is avenged upon his enemies. James dies. Peter is delivered. Agrippa is smitten by the stroke of God's wrathful hand. Acts 12 reminds us that God is God. You need to fear him. Trust him. And don't try to predict the outcomes of your life. Just walk with him. Walk with him and be thankful for whatever befalls you. You know what? I was reminded again, and as we look at the Lord's Supper, everything outside of hell is just pure grace and mercy, isn't it? God is so good to us, so gracious, so merciful. And you know what? You can trust your life in his hands. Nothing, nothing will ever snatch you out of his hands. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercies in our life. Lord, as we come to the Lord's Supper, help us to be mindful of that mercy and that grace. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' love. Thank you.
stand and sing 276, Jesus Paid It All.